Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Poetry Thursday, an informal little tradition on BookTube where some of us read you a poem on Thursday, a couple of poems on Thursday, and maybe talk about it a bit. I am making a project out of my Poetry Thursdays, as always, a psychodrama. I am reading one anthology only, 20th Century American Poetry. Figuring that since I have used the title of this anthology as a standing insult, for a long time, <laughs> very, very long time, since 1959, uh, I could at least plummet steps. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going through it sequentially. Uh, and we have just finished this book's section on the Harlem Renaissance, which uh, the more I, I mean, I loved, I loved reading that section, but the more I read it, the more aware I was that this was at least partially envisioned as a textbook. The distinction itself seems to me to be less than helpful, especially since so many of the writers that we were reading for the Harlem Renaissance section vigorously denied association with the Harlem Renaissance. So uh, we're, we're not changing our time frame much for these next few poets, maybe this next whole section. It's still going to be in the 20s and 30s, thereabouts. But uh, with Gathering Clouds, the, the, the poetry that could be written in the, the very early part of the 20th century, the turn of the 20th century, had an inescapable innocence that just as inescapably goes away once you have World War I, and then the weird excess of the Roaring Twenties, and then the Great Depression, and then World War II. Those things change everything. And the first thing they change is poetic sensibility. So we're going to see that, but I don't know. We've moved out of Harlem anyway. <laughs> so we are, in fact, today we are talking about a poet named Sarah Teasdale, who was just quoted uh, on the header above the masthead of the Martha's Vineyard Gazette, just recently, an issue had a line by Sarah Teasdale, who did spend time on the Cape, uh, did spend time on the Vineyard, spent time in Massachusetts, um, and started, initially claimed her fame as, as a, a, a poet of love verse, of just intoxicated love verse. That wasn't true for most of her life. And most of her life, she had not only a besetting illness, but also a secret. And it turned her poetry darker and, and more uh, finalistic, fatalistic, as time went on. Kept writing. For most of her career, she kept writing, despite the two burdens that I mentioned. And I want to read you two of her poems uh, today. They're, they're absolutely lovely, uh, both of them. She's, this is a poet I really like. But, uh, and they are both final in their tone, in their tenor, but they deal with different things. Uh, the first one deals with war. And as I think, I don't know that she's remembered at all. I don't think people remember Sarah Teasdale, but if... If she's remembered, I think she's remembered mostly for poems like this, or maybe this one particularly. I would have been surprised if this had not been in this anthology. It's called There Will Come Soft Rains, uh, and it was written in 1920. So, in the aftermath of the First World War, with all the horrors that had come, had redounded to the home front, people, people in, in the First World War, there were no illusions about what the war had been like. Uh, and this, this is uh, that poem, which is uh, subscripted wartime. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire, and not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly, and spring herself, when she awoke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. Uh, which was a, a, a sentiment, a writer that Sarah Teasdale knew quite well, took a tour of the battlefields in France, and noticed nature returning. In what he referred to as a blessedly mindless process. This, this is what we humans interrupt. We interrupt the natural world, and it goes on. The minute we give it a, a chance, it goes on. Uh, and doesn't care about us. Of course, it cares if we destroy its trees or its groves or its, its meadows or its streams, but it doesn't care why, and it doesn't care that we've stopped for any kind of breathtaking of our own, but just because it gets to go back about its work. 
Uh, so I, I love that poem. I just think it's lovely because uh, what, what circumstance, as long as humans are on Earth, when is this poem ever not going to be relevant? Surely in the spring there will be green shoots in Gaza. It's, it's impossible not to think about this. That's the, the greatness of truly great poetry is that you're, uh, you're never really without it. Uh, and then the the other poem that I want that I want to read you here is from 1933. This is much closer to, in fact, I think it was the year of the author's death. Yeah, she died in 1933, uh, and it's full of forbearance, courageous forbearance against death. Uh, this author wrote a number of poems about that fact, about the fact that death was coming, and that there was nothing she could do about it, and that that was just it. Uh, she very much did not believe that she was immortal. She very much did not believe that she was ever going to see or hear or think or write or exist after she died. She very much didn't think that. She grasped at that for comfort now and then, but it's a false comfort, and she saw that clearly. So, uh, But th those were gloomier poems, and there are a couple of those like that in this anthology. I don't want to read one of those. It's gloomy enough on Thursday. So I thought I would just instead read one that's quite lovely on the finality of death. Uh, this is called In a Darkening Garden. Gather together against the coming of the night all that we played with here. Toys and fruits, the quill from the seabird's flight, the small flute, hollow and clear, the apple that was not eaten, the grapes untasted, let them be put away. They served us. I would not have them wasted. They lasted out our day. I don't know, in the face of absolutely an inevitable mortality, I don't know what more to say than that. That's actually quite lovely. <laughs> That's this poet. This poet, just in general, is quite lovely. Uh, so there you go. That's your that's your Poetry Thursday, Sarah Teasdale. Uh, I'll wrap this up, and we will continue on. This is an amorphous what-comes-next chapter in this, in this anthology. Again, clearly artificially divided, I think, for students, for use in the classroom. We'll just take it as it comes. I don't think we have much in the way of grave dangers <laughs> in this particular section. It's the next section that's going to cause me conniption fits, but I'll, I will be in them together, <laughs> so maybe you'll get me through them. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.